There's a vehicle on the pad the night of the launch. Unfortunately, you can't see the lightning in the rain. Uh, as we depart our quarters uh, heading out uh, to the pad, uh, once again, it doesn't show, but it was raining cats and dogs. And uh, I think uh, each of us in the crew were uh, not real confident that we were going to get off. Here's a picture in the cockpit before liftoff. Uh, that's looking over Richard's shoulder. And uh, we got off a little bit late, but we did get the go. And the three main engines started just fine and were running uh, very smoothly uh, when it was a uh, little bit of uh, vibration in the cockpit. Uh, the SRBs lit off and it became very bright, as you can see right here. It was just like day in the cockpit. Uh, and all during first stage, uh, we didn't need lights in the cockpit. It was uh, plenty bright. The uh, Vibration was pretty much like other crews have explained in the cockpit uh, when it, during first stage. Uh, we were shaking around a little bit, but nothing uh, you couldn't handle. And uh, from reports that people on the ground, uh, they got a, a pretty spectacular show. Uh, from inside the cockpit looking out, it, it looked like you kind of expect it to look like uh, at the top of, of this. Uh, you were like you were looking into a cloud with a bright light. I mean, it was just a glow all around the cockpit. And uh, once we got up, away from the ground a little bit you couldn't see the ground anymore and it just looked like you were in the middle of a glowing ball which we were which we were you can see out the windows there that that's a, a sort of a representation here we're going through uh well you just missed the one you just missed the one which uh, kind of reflected a little more light back in the in the cockpit now this is just going through the cloud deck at about twenty thousand feet you can see that the vibration isn't too bad and uh, we're all in there busily checking our instruments uh, being sure everything is running properly the next scene you'll see from the cockpit is when the uh, solid rocket boosters uh, departed, and that was really a bright, bright flash. And after that, uh, there wasn't as much uh, flashing or brightness in the cockpit until SR, uh, until main, I mean, the external tank. There's a set with the SRBs. That's when those rockets push it away, and it really gets bright. Okay, once we got on orbit, uh, the view from space was just spectacular, and this is just an indication of that uh, just from the cockpit. Uh, one of the objectives of our mission was to deploy the INSAT satellite, and this is uh, the cockpit arrangement associated with deploying the satellite. In this particular view, uh, Dan is actually operating the 16-millimeter camera uh, panning the cockpit. You can see Dick over there on the left. He's um, sort, of, sort of supervising the operation. There's Dale. He's going to be handling the cameras and the uh, switches. And I'm working from uh, the commander's seat up front, uh, sending out commands through uh, keyboard and talking to the PAM and uh, a satellite through uh, CRT uh, display. You can see, as I said, with it, that was basically our arrangement. Our, uh, Dan sat in the pilot seat during this operation, uh, sort of monitoring the... Uh, motion of the vehicle making sure that it was steady and that the uh with the you know there were very few uh vibrations of any sort this is a picture of the insat uh actually being deployed from the uh, spacecraft you can see that the, the deploy went very smoothly at the moment of deploy there was a large thump and uh, as i said the uh the spacecraft was deployed very smoothly and uh, there were no vibrations or no uh procession of the satellite as it left the uh, payload bay. Matter of fact, uh, uh, Dale pointed out that uh, about a minute, 20 seconds after deployment, you could see some of the uh, jets on the spacecraft actually firing as part of the uh, nutation control associated with the spacecraft. Another aspect of our mission was uh, checking out the uh, Tedris uh, network. And so the uh, shuttle flew various different uh, attitudes uh, during the mission uh, uh, checking out the KU band and this is the picture of the KU band antenna that was used to check out the, uh, the Tedra satellite. We found that uh, the communications were excellent uh, both up and down and that's going to be a, a real advantage for us uh, on future missions. Another task, of course, was the uh, work with the RMS and the PFTA, the payload flight test article. Uh, in this view, I had the 16-millimeter camera and uh, tried to give you a look at what the uh, RMS, the arm, looks like in its normal berth position. 
here it is stowed as it is for launch and entry and those times on orbit when it's not actually being used it actually rolls in on those uh, on those pylons those mounts that you can see on the bottom the uh, this is a view in the uh, aft flight deck I'm over at the uh, arm uh, station and Richards is to the left to fly the vehicle here you can see uh, the arm going in towards grapple fixture number five remember that's the one on the front of the PFTA you can see here it looks like we're losing losing the view of the uh, arm as it goes behind the DFI pallet in the front however from the cockpit that was a very comfortable thing to do and it never appeared to us that we were getting close to contact this is uh, lifting the PFTA out in direct mode where I'm moving one joint at a time again on grapple fixture five and here's a shot with gravel fixture two. A lot of the tests were putting the arm and the PFTA up in various configurations and then putting pulses into the orbiter or into the arm and seeing what the relative motions were between the two. So while we were doing that, of course, we got some fantastic views of the Earth uh, down below and uh, had the cameras always at the ready to, uh, to get good pictures. Arm operations were extremely, uh, extremely smooth. Richard and I had had no problems operating it from the aft flight deck. You can see that we didn't bother to restrain ourselves in any way when we didn't want to, and uh, the whole task was, uh, was very easy. Uh, we did on flight day five uh, something that surprised us all for, as far as the views go, and that is uh, a look at the underside of the vehicle. This task has always been in our repertoire. It's been in the checklist, but we've never had to use it. Uh, Dick worked on it some in STS-2 uh, in anticipation of being able to look at tile. Uh, here you can see the view of the un underside is, uh, is extremely clear. And again, these are 16-millimeter movies made off the TV film, so the TV is really uh, much better than this. Here we zoom in, I think, on one of the elevons. This is the port elevon, which is down a little bit, and you can see that uh, with the real VTR film, you're almost able to make out uh, numbers on individual tiles. We're really surprised at the great view that, that uh, we got with this technique. The arm, of course, was, uh, was hidden from us. It was down around the bottom of the vehicle, so we really couldn't see it. This series, uh, you can see some vernier jets firing in the back of the vehicle, and after the next one, watch how, how the vernier jet firings excite the glow around the ohm spot. You can see it there. It gets very bright for uh, a few seconds and then slowly fades away, but even at, at its dimmest, you can see that you can still see the glow, and it was even more apparent to us with our, uh, with our eyeballs. Here we're setting up for an on-orbit ohms burn. We're getting some things ready in the uh, mid-deck. There's the ohms engines firing out the back, and now watch what happens in the mid-deck. <laughs> <laughs> That's one sixteenth of a G. Each of the ohms engines is one foot per second squared for a total of uh, two feet per second squared, and that one sixteenth of a G felt, felt like a lot to us after being up there for uh, three or four days. And you can see the acceleration on the tape. It keeps wanting to go back towards the aft bulkhead because we're accelerating forward towards the left of the screen. Uh, this is uh, the final work on one of the Cephas uh, samples. Uh, the sample has already been separated. Uh, the cells are in individual partitions in that tray. I was, you saw me there shaking the tray to make sure the cells mixed with the nutrient materials that had been previously placed in those cells. I'm now putting the, the whole collector tray back into a, a cooler where it uh, remained for the uh, rest of the flight. Bill? Yes, this is uh, an old man in space taking uh, uh, a walk on his walker. And uh, here uh, we have some of the long-suffering crewmen being subjected to uh, a variety of studies looking at uh, various aspects of the vestibular control system, the electronics there. Uh, work very well in that mode. Uh, it's rather simple, but uh, I would compare the quality of the records and such that we obtained to those of uh, labs on Earth. This is um, another aspect looking at uh, how well one can coordinate eye and hands in a uh, complex uh, tracking task. There were and then finally, I guess most of you have seen these, in which you turn your head while the, you track both the head and eye motion, which again allows uh, one to see how well the eyes are capable of uh, tracking and how they're affected. 
These next few scenes uh, just show some other activity. You'll notice how clean the mid-deck is. That we kept it this way the entire flight. <laughs> uh, now, actually, I'm going down there to uh, change the cabin temp controller, which is underneath the mid-deck floor. And uh, you can see just uh, by floating and an occasional uh, toe leaning up on something that you can uh, do your work. And, and it's one of the reasons in zero gravity and on orbit that the people can work such long hours and not get tired. It's just... Uh, it's just a delight to, uh, to work in that environment. This is uh, a, f a little uh, scene on uh, preparing a meal. Each of these uh, food, each is an individual food tray. And uh, we've had, uh, you'll see here in a moment, we've had several calls for guys for uh, Major League Scouts looking for uh, infielders. <laughs> But uh, generally, after a couple of days on orbit, we found that uh, one or two of the guys could set up a meal for all, f all of the crew in just uh, eight or ten minutes. And it was uh, quite convenient and, uh, and uh, provided a, a really nice uh, way to stop work for a little while and, and have a, a hot meal. It was a lot of fun. This is, uh, as a task, uh, about twice a day we had to uh, change the uh, lithium hydroxide canisters also underneath the mid-deck floor. Uh, we had a shopping list of uh, just uh, engineering duties that we had to perform that we've uh, been, that we've, on each of the flights we're trying to record just so that training for future crews can, uh, can uh, go well, and this is an example of one of them, these canisters to use to scrub the air so that it'll be clean and uh, easy to use. You notice uh, this is uh, that the seats, except for the commanders and the pilot's seat up on the flight deck, the mission specialist's uh, seats for ascent and entry are uh, dismantled after you get on orbit, and uh, they're very difficult in 1G and very heavy, heavy to manhandle to install. So we, this is real time. We uh, set up a camera, or at least Dale and Bill and Guy did. And in uh, about two minutes from the time they untaped the chair until uh, Dale had strapped into it and was uh, sitting there was, was just a couple of minutes and it's just a good example of how easy it is to work in, in zero gravity. That kind of ends up our own orbit part of the film. Now we're going to talk briefly about the entry and landing. This is 16 millimeter photography taken by Dale of the front windows. Again, you can see the glow, which now is, uh, is orange in color. And as we described uh, before, these are the pulses taken by Dale by holding a camera and looking aft and above his head, above the tail. We have, uh, and this is real time, incidentally. This pulsing is, uh, is happening at, at the frequency that you're seeing it. It is not understood at the moment. We've shown it to the thermal folks, and uh, it's going to take a little, uh, a little uh, thinking to describe what it is that we're seeing. This is probably a little long for the press conference. We left this entire sequence in so that our engineering friends could uh, take a look at it. One last uh, shot uh, panning of the cockpit with the glow. As it started out, out uh, changing colors, it, up high it was sort of a salmon color and finally got white hot. This is the landing as seen through an infrared uh, camera that was uh, out at Edwards, uh, transported down there from the Navy Weapons Center at Channel Lake. You'll notice it's infrared, so actually the, vis the vehicle was not visible to anybody that was there at this point. The brighter areas are the hottest, and so you can see the red hot or white hot uh, nose cone there. And if you look carefully, you can see that the window areas are also hotter. It's so good that you see the gear deployment, and you can, s and you can uh, see that black area or actually the cold uh, rubber main tires. And uh, we defy Hollywood to uh, match this sequence. This is the uh, Challenger coming in for landing on runway 22 at uh, Edwards. 
You'll see us kicking up a little bit of dust off the runway surface. There's a touchdown, which was uh, uh, fairly smooth, and, and uh, all I can say for the landing is uh, my head is off to the people that helped us develop the, the heads-up display and the night lighting system, and to the great work that was in uh, support for the last year, generally in the middle of the night to the folks out in our shuttle training aircraft that provided Dan and me with the training that it took to, uh, to, to accomplish this first night landing. Finally at the end, here's the crew uh, holding on for dear life to the rails to make sure they don't embarrass themselves walking down these steps, but actually by now, people, uh, everybody was readapting quickly to 1G. And uh, I hope this movie uh, portrays to you the fact that uh, we uh, had a lot of fun on the flight because if it, uh, if it does, it was certainly accurate.